First, I just wanted to thank Ann Bowser and the Wilson Center for hosting today's meeting and for the invitation to moderate. A um, little bit about me, uh, my name is Raleigh Martin. I'm a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow based at the uh, US National Science Foundation Director for Geosciences, working on research data policy. And I just want to note uh, that the opinions I express here are not those of AAAS or NSF, but are mine alone. Um, so um, the earlier panels focused on open science policies, metrics, and infrastructure. The goal for this panel is to discuss what we need to do to move beyond open and into fair data, and to discuss the collection and exchange of fair data in an international framework. Uh, so fair refers to findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, the FAIR guiding principles were developed uh, over a series of meetings, uh, culminating in a 2016 Nature Scientific Data Policy Paper, um, on which actually one of our panelists, Baron Mons, was uh, co-author. Uh, so in brief, findable refers to the ability to locate data by a unique and persistent identifier. Accessible refers to the ability to retrieve data and metadata. Interoperable is the use of shared vocabularies to describe data and metadata. And reusable is the existence of sufficient technical and licensed documentation uh, for data integration and reuse. Um, and a few notes on this definition of FAIR. Uh, it refers both to data and accompanying metadata. Uh, data may be broadly defined um, to include a variety of digital objects, including algorithms, workflows, software, et cetera. Um, importantly, also FAIR refers to not just the human readability of data, but also the machine readability. Uh, and the interpretation and implementation of these FAIR principles is open to a lot of debate. Um, so the definitions that I just gave uh, hopefully are not the definitive ones, but uh, may be discussed a bit by our panelists today. Um, and so uh, the goal, as I see it for the panelists today, is to address a bit more of the details, not only of what the FAIR principles are, but to think about the uh, governance priorities and implementation pathways for achieving fairness in the research enterprise. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview of our panelists before they get started. Our first panelist who will be presenting remotely is Daniel Meachin from the Data Science Institute of the University of Virginia. He's an expert on the development of collaborative web-based platforms for open science and data sharing. Our second panelist, uh, uh, Baron Mons, is the director of the International Support and Coordination Office of the Global Open Fair Implementation Networks, or GoFair, initiative which is pursuing a bottom-up international approach for the practical implementation of the European Open Science Cloud as part of a global internet of fair data and services. Finally, Shelley Stahl is the Director of Data Programs at the American Geophysical Union, AGU, uh, and she's currently leading an international collaboration to enable fair data in the earth, space, and environmental sciences, uh, funded by the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. And so uh, I just wanted to point out before I turn it over to the panelists that there are a bewildering variety of uh, stakeholders involved in trying to make data fair and achieve open science. Um, for example, the Horizon 2020 Fair Data Working Group interim recommendations that were just released uh, recognized nine different stakeholder groups, including research communities, data services, data stewards, standards bodies, global forums, policy makers, funders, institutions, and publishers. Um, and so, I guess a specific goal for the panelists today is to figure out what is a path forward that acknowledges the different interests of all of these stakeholders. Um, which stakeholders should be moving first or do they all move simultaneously? Uh, which aspects of FAIR should be prioritized? And um, what governance framework should exist to decide what the priority should be? Um, and so the order of presentations today will be uh, Daniel, Barron, and Shelley. And I'll note that there is a 10 minute time limit and we're, I'm going to try to enforce that to keep things moving. Uh, and please save the questions until the end. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to um, our remote presenter, Daniel Meachin. Daniel, if you could turn on your video, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'll switch to screen sharing. Now you should all see yourself for a brief moment, and then I'll switch to the presentation. The presentation is actually available um, online and Googleable, and I tweeted it, um, so I tried to be as fair about it as uh, possible. So I'm going to talk about uh, steps that can be taken to, uh, in order to move us towards a fair data ecosystem. And the short summary is um, that uh, 
we try to be as open as possible and as closed as necessary. Um, so the FAIR principles have already been mentioned a number of times. I will not reintroduce them, just a reminder. Um, the uh, point that's important on this slide here is uh, the aim behind the principles is to get machines more involved in the research process, to allow uh, machines to take over some of those things uh, that are easy for machines to do and complex for humans, so that the humans can concentrate on those things that are either more creative or more fun. Daniel, you have Sorry, we, yeah, okay. can't see your slides. we can't see your slides. They can't see my slides. Okay. Uh, I am on screen sharing, actually. So uh, can you see my sh my screen? I can see you. Now, okay. And now I'm, I'm going back to the other screen. Do you see? You don't see my slides? No. Uh, well, <laughs> um, that's interesting. Uh, da -da 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 well, I, I tweeted them. Can you put them up on the screen somewhere or <laughs> otherwise? Um, that's difficult. Yeah, we have a backup. So I actually recorded a version of this talk uh, in anticipation of technical difficulties. And so if you can't see my screen uh, with the slides now, then we may have to do with uh, the recorded version. But I'll remain available for the, for the discussion. Can you see my uh, slide now? Not yet. Okay, well, sorry, then I, I guess uh, we switch over to plan B and just show you the video uh, in which I cannot be as reactive to the um, to, to the previous talks as I wanted to be in, in my live uh, version. Hi, Daniel, what? Suzanne, I'm meddling. Alex is finding your slides now. I think we should pull them up and let you give your presentation and just take 10 minutes from the breakouts. Right. And, and I can advance the, the slides nodding. here while he presents them. Okay, I'm on the FAIR principles slide. Uh, so, which should be slide number three. And I, I switched off the, the live uh, stream, so I don't know. I can't see you at the moment. <laughs> so I'm waiting. I'm waiting for acoustic uh, signals as to when I should proceed. This is great use of open science infrastructure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll try another one. Can you see my slide now? My, oh, we um, got it. We got it. <laughs> Where do you have it? Do you see my screen or do you see uh, the slides somewhere on your screens? We have your slides and we can advance them. Uh, just tell okay. us where to go. So we're right now okay. on the title slide. Yeah, then move uh, forward uh, two slides, basically. <laughs> Uh, and there, and we have We're on the fair principles slide is called now. the fair principles. There we have point number three is um, the essence of the fair principles is to actually get machines more involved in the research process, um, so that um, the, the tediest tasks uh, that can be automated can actually be performed by machines and help humans in doing the research, so that the human researchers can concentrate on those parts that are either more creative or more fun. Um, the FAIR principles can also serve as a bridge uh, between different research cultures. So industry uh, research was already briefly mentioned, citizen science was mentioned, open science is in the title of the event. Uh, these are different approaches to research cultures and then the different disciplines of course have different approaches um, to research as well. And the FAIR principles um, are to some extent agnostic to it but to, uh, uh, to another extent actually specific enough to uh, take into account specificities of those different approaches. Uh, the FAIR principles themselves, though, they do not provide details of implementation, which is why, next slide please, the European Commission, including Jean-Claude, uh, actually set up an expert group uh, to provide recommendations on what to do next in order to achieve FAIR data at scale. Uh, so at the scale of the European Commission, of European Union member states and at the international level. And the task of that group consisted of two main things. One is to write a report on the current situation and uh, the necessary steps forward. And uh, two, uh, to come up with an action plan that actually um, distills concrete recommendations and puts them on somewhat, uh, not directly a timeline, but at least a prioritization list. And uh, next slide, please. 
So the four, four key steps that are identified in that report are uh, that we need to actually define FAIR. To some extent, this has happened in the original paper that was already mentioned, but there are certain components that are essential to actually implementing FAIR that are not uh, mentioned prominently in that original paper. That is, for instance, the timeliness of sharing or ethical aspects of sharing. So we need to uh, define FAIR uh, in such context. We shouldn't change the acronym because it's a very um, well successful acronym, but we should basically enrich its definition. Second, once we have this uh, enriched definition, we should uh, work towards um, sustainability of the infrastructure around uh, data. That has already been mentioned in a number of the previous presentations that sustainability of the infrastructure is a big problem. We don't have good mechanisms for that. Um, but if you want to achieve fair data, then uh, we, we need to make uh, actual progress in this regard. The third of the key steps is that uh, the data don't sit there alone. They are embedded into an ecosystem um, that um, involves not just data, but metadata and services. And they need to be fair to the extent possible as well. Um, so that the different components of the ecosystem can actually interact with each other and the machines have something to do. Finally, um, and very importantly, um, which, uh, which was also already mentioned in some of the incentives uh, debate just in the previous panel, um, we need to actually work on the culture aspects um, of getting share into research practice. Uh, getting fairness into research practice because right now it is not part of uh, most communities um, daily research practice to share in a fair manner and uh, that uh, stands in the way of actually uh, scaling up adoption. Next slide. So the report um, is split into six chapters that take on different topics uh, so one each and all uh, being aware of those four key steps that need to be taken. So we, we have chapters on data policy, on research culture, on infrastructure, on kind of uh, the skills that people need in order to navigate um, this new developing ecosystem and on how we can give them those skills. Then on metrics, how to assess uh, different components of this fair data ecosystem and their interactions, and then on how much it costs. And Jean-Claude was already mentioning um, also how much it costs not to go fair. Then, the stakeholders were also already mentioned in the introduction, so I'll not repeat them. Uh, in the report, we really tried to look at uh, the fair data eco landscape um, from uh, those different perspectives and uh, to come up with recommendations as to what individual stakeholder communities could do uh, in concrete terms. Um, in discussing this, uh, we looked at fair data objects so, and um, tried to define those as having some sort of data and data actually writ large um, could also be software, could be um, other resources. Um, and then they, those data, they need to have an identifier, they need to have uh, things uh, like open formats that follow certain standards and they need to come with proper metadata, which is basically uh, written in those fair principles. But a uh, key thing in, uh, that the report adds is that we need basically a cloud of registries. So uh, the, the identifier schemas, the standards, and the metadata schemas, the uh, repositories, the policies, they all need to be basically um, re registered somehow so that the system becomes aware of them and each of them becomes findable. So that, for instance, a researcher can find out which policies apply to their particular research project. Then if we zoom out uh, from individual fair data objects, we have this uh, entire ecosystem where the individual components interact with each other. Um, and hopefully many of the interactions can be automated. Um, so for instance, a repository can be notified uh, when uh, a data management plan mentions that there is nine petabyte coming their way, these kinds of things. Um, yeah, and in the report, we also look at uh, case studies. Uh, so for instance, there are certain communities that have already come up uh, with similar principles to the FAIR principles, like in linguistics and astronomy. We look at some of those uh, cases that have been uh, proposed as extensions to the FAIR um, acronym. Basically, people have proposed an entire soup of um, alphabets or uh, letters around the FAIR acronym. Um, and some of those uh, proposed extensions are, are really important to, to get um, FAIR data ecosystem implemented. 
And uh, so we look, for instance, at the case of public health emergencies where the timeliness of the sharing is really important. Um, another thing that we looked at is a uh, platform for open science and citizen science called Wikidata, which is a cross-disciplinary uh, fair data platform. Uh, it actually comes out from outside the research ecosystem, from the wiki community, Wikipedia community, um, but it can be used for uh, real uh, research applications and is being integrated more and more uh, with the wider web. Um, and um, yeah, similar to the slide that N showed about GBIF being central to biodiversity data, Wikidata is uh, being central to the semantic web at large. Sorry to interrupt, can you um, refer to which slide you're on? I think we might have lost you here. I'm on the fair and open slide now. Okay, excellent. And probably two more minutes. Okay, good. So um, since the event is about openness, a uh, question about open and fair or fair and open often come, pops up since many people use them interchangeably. Uh, and we make the case that this should actually be avoided. So, and there are lots of open data that are not fair. There are lots of fair data that are not open and both come in different shades of gray basically. Um, and so they should be treated differently, but uh, the potential for interaction between fair and open is great and uh, should actually be looked at um, specifically. So they can really enhance each other and key principle uh, behind their interaction should be that uh, research should be shared as openly as possible and as closed as necessary, when actually necessary. Then the a Fair Data Action Plan comes in uh, 34 recommendations that we actually try to keep uh, short so that they are tweetable and people will actually read them. Um, here is the entire list. I, don't, I know we don't have time uh, to go through it, um, but um, each of those comes with a, an entire paragraph. Oh yeah, next steps, we're on slide 14 now. <laughs> Um, so the next steps the slide is um, pointing out that there is currently a consultation process going on. So the uh, report and the action plan are released as draft versions. There uh, is a consultation period where you can comment on them. Um, and uh, so here are the links. I also tweeted the links uh, to the uh, presentation and it's easily Googleable. Uh, and uh, so the report can be edited right away in a Google Doc and the, on the action plan you can comment on GitHub. The uh, feedback that we receive by August 5 will then be incorporated into the final versions of those documents that is due to be released by November. And uh, perspectives are not uh, limited to EU. Uh, as Jean-Claude said, it doesn't really make sense to think fair in just European terms. And so non-EU perspectives are uh, very welcome because the European ones are in those documents uh, quite prominently already. So that's it, uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. So while my slides are being pulled up, <clears throat> let me also thank you for inviting me. Uh, I have one uh, American person working in my team, Eric Schultes. Uh, Shelley knows him very well. And he said, ooh, the Wilson Center, that's something if you go there. So I should be very impressed, I suppose, to be here. Um, what I'm going to, to, to do, I, I changed my slide this morning when I listened to the other panels because I have a series of uh, seven cartoons which are the seven capital deadly sins of open science. And I, I decided that those are actually for tomorrow uh, also for the meeting at NSF, but I decided to push them in anyway. I still hope to be doing this within 10 minutes, we'll see. Um, otherwise, you'll just kick me. <laughs> so um, the states of affairs, of course, there's another word play on fair there. Uh, and uh, I would, would quickly go through that um, and start with saying that indeed I was the chair appointed by uh, Jean-Claude, I always say not Jean-Claude, of course, with Jean-Claude, uh, in, uh, in the high level expert group. And here you see some of our recommendations and these are related to this internet of fair data and services. Then you need a very light internationally effective governance, only guide where guidance is through the hourglass model, I'll come back to that later. Uh, define rules of engagement for people to keep minimally and then federate the gems as we call it, the existing excellence in the member states and of course we talk uh, generally for the whole world. Um, 
Then I was invited some time ago to speak for something that is apparently close to the Wilson Center. It's the European Political Strategy Center. And they asked me to talk about this title. They gave me the title. I didn't make it up. So how to reconcile GDPR with artificial intelligence. Now, first of all, everybody that does a little bit of statistics now calls it artificial intelligence because then you get money. So there is very little artificial intelligence going around at the moment. But I put it up because I think it is, as Jean-Claude already said, um, the big change that we will see is that we go from data collection and then running big algorithms on collected data to a completely distributed learning system. And as my data as a patient, for example, or a citizen stay in my personal locker and I decide who can visit them, that solves 90% of the problems that the GDPR has created for research. So we'll see that later. And I, I was not able to show a two-minute movie, but I will show you the links, and the links will be sent around. There is two movies, three movies now, that show you how this works with distributed learning already in health and agriculture. So this is a summary of GoFair, the, the initiative I lead. This is a summary we put up at the summit that Jean-Claude was mentioning on the 11th of June. Uh, it started to say, okay, if we need to federate the gems, 90% 95% of the money anyway for the cloud will come from the member states. Let's see what is there. Let's start. And three countries, the Netherlands, Germany and France, took the initiative to set up international support offices. Twelve people all together. I'm heading the Dutch one, but effectively we work as one office uh, across the three countries. And we do two things. We help international excellent networks, implementation networks, as we call them, on the road. And we support countries that want to join. And tomorrow we also discuss how the United States could join because it's global open fair. It's not restricted to Europe. Even the UK can uh, answer, can, can uh, participate. Now, the internet for social machines is what people uh, int understand a bit more than the internet of fair data and services. So basically we go from a period through a bottleneck where people did science and they read papers and they published papers. And now we have, during this talk, 60 new papers in PubMed. So what's the point? I cannot read them anymore. I gave up 10 years ago reading papers for exploration. Machines, as Daniel also said, will create the, the hypotheses for us, looking over millions of data records. And then, so we go to the Internet of Fair Data and Services, is in fact the Internet for Social Machines, where machines are very important users. And for a few more years, if you all have read Homo Deus, they will still be having human bosses, but soon it will be the other way around. They will keep a few humans in zoos. That's uh, probably what. So I don't have to go into this because it was very well covered by people. I was just re-emphasizing, but Daniel already did this, that fair really means that machines can read, uh, can understand your stuff, not just people. Okay, so people that say my paper is fair, hmm. I'll, I'll come back to that. And as I said, we will have the EOSC. There is stuff in the EOSC that is not covered by GoFair, but GoFair is also global. So we are looking at participation for China. I'm going to China next week. They invest a lot of money. Uh, Australia, Africa, there's open science clouds coming up everywhere, which is very interesting, actually. So the famous hourglass model, uh, George Strong is, is there, it's almost a saint for me now. He told me, don't go beyond the center of the TCP IP of the hourglass, only set standards where you cannot avoid them, rigorously implement them and leave freedom to operate. My favorite example is GBIF. If uh, we have 120, uh, 112 institutions also in DISCO that say we use GBIF, the Naturalysis and, and all of those uh, uh, institutes. But if 113 says, no, let's do um, uh, the Encyclopedia of Life, and they map it to GBIF, they're still fair because the computer knows what they mean. But the identifier scheme for e EOL is much less stable than for GBIF. So we still prefer GBIF, but that's already the first level of freedom to operate. We won't and tell people, use this ontology, otherwise you cannot be part of the EOS score of GoFair. So in the Internet of Fair Data and Services, we have in the center the persistent resolvable identifier. So the essence of FAIR is machines understand what you mean by any concept, ORCID for people, VIVO for institutions, whatever you choose. Don't use terms like PSA, which has 189 different meanings in Medline alone, 
computers get crazy. We heard the protein this morning. It was terrible. So, and the, the second thing is that is essential to FAIR is that your metadata should be rich and should be machine readable using RDF or JSON, LD, any of the uh, known computer readable languages. And then we reach this. And this is my, this is big in my office and I tell everyone who enters, we have data, tools and compute. All of them need machine readable metadata because they are distributed all over the place. This could be all on your smartphone but we also have a Dutch company that has heaters, like boilers, we call them, for your shower. And I do all my protein calculations with Eric on these boilers. And we pay half of the price of the heating of the houses because the computer is a water-cooled, high-performance computer, the, the boiler. And they are connected with high-speed internet, so who cares where they are? But what you see more and more is that tools will visit the data. The data are frequently petabytes. You try to send a petabyte over the internet, forget it. And also, they are frequently too private, like my personal data, to be moved. So forget data sharing, use the term data visiting. So the algorithms visit the data. The algorithms are tiny. They can fly over the internet with the speed of light and the data stay where they are. That's the future, distributed learning. So why the PEEP, we always say, do we not have this for years? Now I quickly have the seven deadly sins and if, if the chair stops me, I will just stop. Uh, so the first is the silverbacks. You know, they, uh, this one is reading the book, Seven Ways to Prevent Change. They have thrived on the old system. They don't want to change. So now science progresses one funeral at a time, as we say. Uh, because they say, oh, age factor, age factor, or age factor, I don't know. Uh, and the young people that use the new technology, they don't get a career this way. And these guys, or mostly guys, unfortunately, sit in the review panels for the grants and for all the other things. So that's the first thing. The other thing is, and, and I talked to Richard already in the break, I think ignoring the complexity that the big data are now revealing and still go back to read papers and databases to explore, you should do confirmational reading. If anyone does that in my lab, he gets fired. Ignore the complexity. That's why the pharma is in crisis. You think you have one target, okay? Then you have, there is enough infrastructure, coming back to what they said, but it doesn't work for biologists. They don't understand the data scientists. We have to respect the disciplines. Then. We should not publish our data without a supplementary paper. I always say that to tease the publishers because now we, the, the second worst invention after the impact factor is supplementary data that are never there. So we can generate as many uh, correlations as we want in big data, but we need to have provenance and I can have to see and my computer as well where it comes from. So this is how we publish today. This is a nightmare for machines. So here we see the train, we have the personal health train, it's a Docker image or whatever, trying to get to my data. It has to first pass a firewall or a paywall. And even if the article is open access, it's still a nightmare for computers. So you get in as a computer, as an algorithm. Then the real interesting stuff is in TIFF files of uh, tables and figures. If you have not committed suicide by then, you go and try and find a link somewhere in the paper, totally unexplainable link to supplementary data that are somewhere and 30% of those links die every year, as we all know. This is horrible. So we should really, if you look in the, in the smoke of the train, this, I have only two more slides and I'm done. Uh, the EOSC uh, is there. We should publish data in computer readable format and we have a supplementary paper to explain for people what we concluded from that data and then offer them for others to use. Then the one but last slide, uh, coming back to the infrastructure, I now say we all want to invest in rocket science, the funders, and I call infrastructure now structurally the rocket launcher. So here you see all these professors with their rocket, but nobody invested in the infrastructure to launch the rockets, now we still don't launch them, so the impact is still zero. So that's what Jean-Claude also said, 5% of all research should be invested in the use of infrastructure, in the building of infrastructure, so you create a market, which is about 10 billion for Europe alone, public sector, Elsevier recognized that there is a $100 billion market coming for data stewardship. 
And finally, I think we should actually be much harsher on researchers. These are the professors that say, oh, I take public money and I then generate data. I don't even have a data stewardship plan. And this is, data is the new oil? No. Data is like love. It multiplies when shared, you know? <laughs> and oil is a horrible thing if you don't have a, a, a whole uh, system around it, you are doing this. So I tell researchers who complain that I tell them to spend 5% of their money on data stewardship, that if you take public money and you don't even take care of the data that you generated with my money, you should be in jail. So we have to be much tougher, not only the, the carrot, but also the stick. Just request data stewardship plans for everything that will generate data, and otherwise don't fund it. That's it. Thank you. All these cartoons are CC by whatever. No, no. I was going to ask that. I want. I seriously <laughs> need at least the one with the train. That. Uh. So so while they're getting my slides up, so I'm Shelley Stahl. I am the director of data programs at the American Geophysical Union. Our. Um, our centennial is going to be in 2019. The American Geophysical Union branded 100 years ago. We are not American and we are not just geophysical. We are international, at least 144 countries um, in Earth, space, and environmental sciences. All right, the one that's blank, got it. Okay, so um, so here, here's, here's what, so we're a society publisher. I might be the only public, no, no, there was another publisher here, so there's a few of us. Um, and we believe in FAIR, so you are, should all know what FAIR is right now. Um, we have 20 peer-reviewed journals, four of which are Gold Open Standard. We're very proud of that. All of the newest ones are Gold Open Standard. Um, and let me move quickly into why I'm so enamored with FAIR. Um, so we, we want to grant, uh, as, as Raleigh had mentioned, from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, and what that grant allowed us to do was to implement a project that we'd been working on um, and we really felt it was time. So we have over 60,000 members worldwide, um, and we were aware of the challenge of data within the supplementary information. You cued me up perfectly. Mm -hmm. Data has to come out of the supplement. Bingo. Just bottom line. How do you do that? Well, as a publisher, we have, a, we have some... Um, some ability to do that, but not by ourselves. And I'm fairly certain that most publishers felt the same way. We can't make a policy change so significant like that by ourselves. The, the researchers will shop around, they'll go somewhere else. So AGU had a, actually a pre-existing relationship with all of the leading publishers, and we thought, you know what, if we take them all with us, the researchers can't shop around, and we can actually make a change worldwide in a fairly short period of time. So th these are the two things that we're working on within this grant. One of them, and I'm, I'm using the word fair aligned, and that's because you all are smart. We are very specific to publication and repositories as part of our stakeholder community, and I'll talk more about that because I'm reaching out to the rest of the stakeholders for help. We are not hitting every letter equally. Um, and so we don't want to say fair compliant because we don't want a repository to think, oh, I'm fair compliant because AGU said so. No, you're not. You're close. Keep working. But please get at least as far as we need you to and then keep going further. Um, so these are, these are the elements. And the most important thing here on this slide is the fact that the data will no longer be in the supplement. You can read the rest and it's all really important. Um, so here's the folks that are participating, and GoFair's on this list too, it's just that the, I ran out of t um, room on the page. Um, and there are a whole lot of other uh, important uh, uh, critical elements, and we have a, um, we're working with the folks at Copernicus who are supporting the EGU's journals. Um, I was just at the EGU meeting, and they are incredibly supportive of the work that we're doing, and we're really excited to have them as part of our community. Um, who else to highlight? I think you can all read. Um, but really, we do have most of the leading journals up here, and that's what makes this work. We're going to move as a block. Um, OK, great. OK, so let's talk about the stakeholder community. And, and this, is, this is where I'm reaching out. Um, so, so we have publishers kind of lined up. OK, so maybe not all. We, you know, society publishers are a little bit, um, it takes a little bit longer to get culture change there. So they're coming along, but mostly agreeable. Um, repositories uh, coming along, mostly agreeable, and especially if you're in the EU, thanks. I think you took care of my whole issue there, yo. Um, 
uh, so, so, but we have problems that are going to happen, and one of those problems is going to be uh, aligning with funder policy. Okay, so that's one. So put your, put your finger on that one. And the other one I want to highlight, among the many other things we could talk about for hours, uh, the one I want to highlight is incentives for researchers. That's been a theme today, and I completely um, echo that theme back. We are thinking very hard. Remember, we're, we're society first. Uh, we have membership that is going to be um, challenged with our, the new policy coming out for publication, and we are incredibly sensitive to that. Um, we want to do everything that we can, and I'm going to tell you about some of the things we're putting into place. But there are broken pieces, badly broken pieces for incentive and credit, and this is where I really need help, and I am happy to lift and, um, you know, if we can get those institutions thinking harder, and I wrote down so many notes today about making that happen. Um, and then the infrastructure for credit is a really big deal too. Um, uh, and I can talk about that for another couple hours. So, so first of all, let's talk about the Belmont Forum. So here we have an international funder. So they represent 25 different funding agencies worldwide. They have been incredibly interested and supportive of our project. And the piece of the puzzle here I want you to understand is about the same time we started, they started, before FAIR existed, um, uh, thinking towards how we can help researchers with data management, how we can help them document their data better. Um, and they, they implemented a, uh, a, an effort called e-infrastructures and data management. Um, and what that did is they, they set up these principles, uh, discoverable, accessible, understandable, manageable, weird, doesn't that sound like fair? Um, so it's fairly aligned. And uh, they have initiatives that they're working on. And the whole point of what they're doing is they're trying to take these concepts and very aligned with our project, very aligned with your project, um, and make sure that the 25 separate funding agencies are adopting similar data expectations for their researchers. Does this not blow your mind? I mean, they're gonna do this. This is gonna actually happen. And we are delighted because that means what we're trying to do um, as part of the entire process for research. So think about publication kind of being sort of towards the end, right? So by the time you hit publication, we tell you, hey, you needed to take care of your data, should have been in a repository, kind of late, right? A little late. Um, but here, we're gonna ha have it happen right at the beginning of the funding process. Um, and this is, I'd really like to have a conversation like this with everyone who gives money to a researcher. Please, let's align. This makes a lot of sense. Um, we, we, you know, we can stand politely next to each other, but if we can align like this, we have a lot in common and we're saying the same things to researchers and we're not confusing them. So what do we need to do? Um, we in our community, Earth, Space, Environmental Science, we have approximately 300,000 researchers. There's no way I can get to them fast enough ahead of the policy, just no way. Nor are they gonna be completely enamored by the fact that we just implemented it. And since it's at the time of publication that they need to actually have everything in line, they're probably not gonna pay attention till publication. Okay, here are the things that we need to get to them. How do we get those to them? Well, Go Fair has an initiative, Go Train. Um, we're really interested in that and working with Eric and Barron on that to see if there's ways to leverage that. Um, there was already mentioned data carpentry and software carpentry, and they're working on um, another, right now I believe it's um, a, a pilot for uh, fair carpentry, so to get these elements together. Um, so we're, we're not gonna be able to hit all 300,000 in their preferable language, right? Um, but we are going to try to push, but using our project, a platform to essentially what we're calling the front line for researchers. So these are your editors, these are your research offices, these are uh, librarians and data managers, the folks that researchers go to when they say, I don't get what just happened to me. Um, so this is, this is the community we're heading towards. Um, and our, uh, our effort is going to start, and this is super soon, a um, couple weeks. <laughs> uh, so starting at about mid to end of July, we'll push out this content and information which is ready to go uh, and, and move it uh, into uh, a common web space and in a common webinars and just get those folks ready. We're not doing anything that isn't happening today. We've got data citation, we've got repositories. Um, we just wanna make sure that those first, those frontline responders are actually ready to receive the questions. So one of the things to highlight, um, there's a lot of incredible effort happening with the project. 
Um, and one to highlight for you in specific is um, the fact that training is going to be necessary. The Earth Science Information Partners, this is a group that's funded by U.S. agencies, NASA and USGS and NOAA primarily. Um, they do a lot of work on developing capabilities and helping researchers. And then they also have connections um, worldwide, and they just kicked off uh, ESIP Down Under, which has been very exciting. Um, one of the reasons I highlight them is they've done some really great work um, uh, on their data management training clearinghouse. So this is run by a woman, um, Nancy Hobelheimrich, uh, and she has uh, pulled together different sources of funding, and right now she's got an MLS grant um, that this is a, and had a and had staged crowdsourcing efforts internationally. So international content is in here um, in order to help our project provide training for researchers worldwide. So if you go here, you can actually find content that you can either um, help share with other researchers or guide researchers to. Um, and this is just one thing I, I wanted to highlight for you as an incredible resource that is comes out of our uh, it, 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 is helped by our project. We didn't do the whole thing. There was many other funders, um, but it's one of the things that we're going to um, promote uh, uh, largely. The other one, I'm going to back up one. The other one, this this first item here having to do with researchers. One of one of the things. That, so, if you're a researcher, you think to yourself, "My data goes in the supplement. That's what I've been doing for years." What do you mean? My data has to be in a repository. What repo What is that? My Dropbox? Is that you know? What is that exactly? Oh my goodness! Do we have training to do there? Well, what we'd like to do is build these relationships between researchers and repositories. Once a researcher finds a home repository, that should be a relationship that lasts a long time. And that's where they're going to get their support for persistent identifiers and making sure the metadata is interoperable and, and fully documented, um, and making sure that they're picking good licensing, preferably as open as possible, as close as necessary. We know how that rolls. Um, uh, but this tool is being built by DataSite. We have a tool that's being built using the content from RE3 data as the um, uh, as the main engine, and they have repository aggregated repositories. It's a registry of repositories. Um, uh, and so we're going to start with the Earth-based and environmental sciences, and then this tool can be used by any funder, anyone worldwide, to help your researcher find their repository. We're really proud of that, and the intention is to expand it for all domains. So it's an opportunity for anyone to actually um, use it going forward for anything that you're working on, to connect your researchers to the right repository. Um, and we're and it's it's trying to highlight the things that are um, support fair. So how'd I do, Raleigh? Uh, Twelve minutes. Twelve minutes? Oh, two over. Oh well. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> uh, thank you to all of our presenters. Um, I wanted to just note two things. First, we've been granted a 10-minute extension to 3.40 p.m. on account of the technical difficulties. So don't worry, there will be time for questions. Um, second, I just want to ask one question to kind of lead into the conversation, then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, so it seemed like there was general agreement about the need for fair data to be readable not only by humans, but also by machines. Um, and I think there's also agreement that the first thing we need to do is to get the data out of the supplements to journal articles. Uh, but beyond that, it sounds like there's a lot of steps that need to be taken in terms of um, defining standards for data, training researchers on appropriate practices. And behind that, there is a human element of governance and of um, implementation. And so I wonder, what do the panelists think um, is the best approach to that? Would it be something more top-down in terms of requirements set by journals and by funders? Or is something more bottom-up, maybe driven by researcher incentives for uh, citations, such as the data site <coughs> effort? Um, so I guess we'll start with Daniel, and then we'll just go through the panelists. You might want to get closer to the, yeah. OK, so can you hear me? Yes. OK, yeah, so my uh, gut feeling uh, to that would be don't start uh, from just one end. So really keep both ends in mind and also um, think about um, how you can leverage the, uh, for instance, open science principles to uh, move forward with uh, advancing FAIR. One of the problems with um, adopting FAIR practices is since most of the research right now is not open, you can't easily learn from how others do it. So 
um, if we support a number of pilot projects that uh, are funded to do things in the open and to do things in a fair way, then everybody else can look at those and then learn from them. Um, and then um, these things can, can build the basis for um, propagating fair practices into the wider ecosystem. On the other hand, um, individuals or groups who try to uh, incorporate elements of that, elements of openness, like citizen science, for instance, they open a certain part of their research cycle, and that is progress towards sharing, uh, or um, even entirely closed projects that uh, try to be, to be as fair as possible, uh, for instance, on patient data or something, these things should be uh, supported as well. And then they, we should have mechanisms for others to learn from, so that, for instance, if I want to, uh, to aggregate data from one particular patient in a certain setting, then the methods that I'm using for aggregating that, they should be transferable to a, a, a comparable setting. And so I don't share the data, uh, I would share my algorithms, as um, Baran put it, uh, my tools uh, to actually make the data fair. For, for the project the, that, that I'm working on, um, we, we picked up a nickname called the Green Project. We we're trying not to do anything new other, other than the data site tool. We're, we're pretty much using what's out there and, and, and adopting it and highlighting it. So there, there's a couple different um, levels that we're looking at. One of them is, especially when it comes to um, like data citation standards and software citation standards, um, Force 11's done a lot of work, so we're, we, just, we just took it. We said, hey, can we, can we do this? Can we adopt this? Yes. Um, RDA, Research Data Alliance, has put out a lot of incredible content, um, and so we're partnering with the different interest groups there. Hey, can we, Scholix, for instance, is one that we're heavily looking at. There's also a data policy for publishers um, interest group we want to make sure we're aligned with um, and, and that, that lines up. So that's kind of overarching standards. Um, when it comes to actual make, actually making sure that the data is well documented and the data makes sense within the context for science, um, I'm thinking of the OIIS words where you're, you want to make sure that you are working with the community um, and, and you all probably know the words a little better than I do, but the, the community of practice, the one that, that's using this data. So this is an area that we've made a little progress into, but it will take more time. Um, identifying uh, for e So keep in mind, coming from a publisher in society, we're careful not to say to the domains, this is how you should do it, right? You don't want to do that. You want to say, hey, how do you do it? And can we highlight the fact that that's a good idea? So this, um, this relationship with domains is something that we are, we're trying to think about how to develop and create and start. Um, so that we can um, move forward with uh, higher quality and promote higher quality metadata. But that's, again, other pieces of the stakeholder community. That's really not where the publisher piece is. It really comes from other pieces, but we're encouraging it. So I would like to concentrate on the training uh, aspect. Uh, I was worried a lot when I heard people say this morning, we have to train researchers. Of course, we have to train researchers. And actually, uh, Jean-Claude mentioned Leru. The, uh, they have a summer school every year where they have the 50, you know, potential Nobel Prize winning students coming together. And we did at LUMC in Leiden, we did the summer school two years ago in 2016. And we told the students that by the end of the week's course, they should be consciously incompetent about data stewardship. And the reason we did that is I think the biggest mistake we could make is try to make every future researcher a half-baked data steward. This is a new profession. And we need people that are so good that I want to sit them next to me when I start to plan my experiment and they tell me which metadata to capture and what provenance is. They know licenses, they know everything. So we start all kinds of... Uh, uh, training courses uh, at high school uh, at uh, master's level in the Netherlands now and one of the most criticized parts of our report was that we said we needed to train 500 the high level expert group report was that we needed to train 500,000 data stewards in in Europe and I think a million here now how do we come to this number again our magic 5% I think a modern research group that spits petabytes of data in my field 
for every 20 data spitters, you need a professional data steward that knows everything, that writes your data stewardship plan during your grant proposal, which will only get accepted by the funders now if, the, if it's properly ticked off by a certified data steward that knows what he or she is talking about. And researchers should not try to do that. So the cartoons come from my book, Data Stewardship for Open Science, Implementing Fair Principles. Little self-promotion here, but in the introduction, I make that very clear. Don't try to become a data steward if you are a top scientist. Hire one in your team. It's a new profession. And those people will know how to do this, the, 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 the sticks and the carrots. They will, they will know how to do this. Yeah. So don't make the mistake to try and make every future researcher a data steward. Okay, any audience questions? Yes. And uh, please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Beth Flaley with the National Science Foundation. Byrne, thank you for the um, uh, for the, the talk that you've given. Um, you know, and I've certainly heard it before. Um, so you you have your train um, cartoon, which is which is quite nice. Um, you've talked governance and you've talked minimal governance. Um, where and 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 GoFair is obviously you know getting good traction in Europe. Uh, how do you see that mapping to? The research landscape in the United States, where you know we're obviously not multiple countries, federation takes some form, but it, it's form among uh, federal agencies, form among major projects, form around something. So, just your thoughts there would be helpful. Okay, so <clears throat> of course, GoFair started in Europe as a reaction to the EC initiative, and uh, in so. It started without countries being involved at the country level. It started with the implementation networks like, you know, the, the biodiversity, the AGU stuff, the, uh, you know, C Data Cloud and so on. Then suddenly the three countries said, we, we think we need some governance on to make sure that also countries who invest a lot are not reinventing the wheel. So we also need some country level coordination. Initially it was like, oh no, bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. But that worked out very well, even with Germany and France, big countries. You know, they said, okay, super light. You start an office. You, uh, if you do that, you support what is happening nationally, the, the participation in implementation networks. Some countries combine it with the RDA node, like in Hungary and the smaller countries. And then you have somebody in the steering committee. Then when I talked to George and Phil and people here, Mark Musen and people in San Diego, they want to start GoFair offices. Obviously, there will be more than one in the United States. We cannot have four, 54 and then 54 people in the steering committee, of course. Uh, and I think also with the current government, we talked a, a lot with, with George, maybe the ORFG and the, and, and the, the non-governmental uh, research is very important and maybe you decide to have one at NIST, one at NIH, NSF and one at NIH and we decided in Europe to say we will not interfere on how other continents will organize this uh, if they want to do it their way that's, so next week I go to China they will do it yet another way in Latin America they think all the shallow nodes uh, yeah. in every country that already exist so Abel Parker says, why not make them go fair off this? Fine, if you decide that, we, we don't have these rules. We just say, if you want to organize what's happening already in your country and help to support it, then start an office. And I even tell countries in Europe, if you don't have anyone in your country yet participating in a go fair implementation network, why have an office? It's not a goal to have as many countries as possible. We want countries that say, hey, we are very motivated because we see the intrinsic value of, of helping our scientists to participate in the Internet of Fair Data and Services. So tomorrow, I hope we can discuss a little more about that. How can we find the most suitable way to support? There's already three offices developing in the U.S. anyway, um, but it's up to, to the U.S. to organize that, of course. Did you want to chime in? There? No, I just, when you mentioned Cielo, I'm really excited because we just started talking to them and they have actually done quite an, um, an amazing amount of work. And I don't know if you're familiar with South America and Portugal and they, they've they been able to actually um, connect all these nodes together. And I, I, I'm, I'm just delighted 
they're way ahead of us in many ways. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They, so it looks like we'll partner on something together. So I'm, I'm hoping yeah. that works out. Yeah. Well, they have uh, Shello 20 years, uh, the big meeting in September. I will be there in Sao Paulo and one of the keynote speakers and panelists. And the, the aim of Abel, the director, is to get, uh, you know, commitment of all the shallow nodes in Latin America to join GoFair. Yep, he is an impressive person, yes. And a good friend. Daniel, did you want to chime in on this question? Um, no, I guess um, Baron has said most of those things already. So I'm just nodding. Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Bonnie Carroll, CoData and Information International Associates. And Ryan earlier was talking about Agave, which is kind of a platform. And so you talked about GoFair offices and connecting GoFair. But I was, we ran out of time. But how about all these platforms in the United States? How do we ever, are we ever going to have a US version of a European cloud, however dissociated. You have everything from an agency, the National Library of Medicine, with their commons development. You have Agave. They're, they're, they have a national data service. All of these things does, I don't know if Ryan is still around or you, is there any sense of where there might be in the United States a coale coalescence of something that would be like a federated light structure in the United States? Anybody? Well, I think, I think it's as long as we follow this internet approach, I mean, we have as many platforms and people that have tried to monopolize this field in Europe. Eh? There is, that's not different. I think the federate the gems and create a market, as Jean-Claude said, imagine that we have a hundred billion euro market for, this is why the Elseviers and the fixed shares and everyone moves in. And when, and all of them have signed up with GoFair, and you sign up for two things, essentially, when you join a GoFair implementation network. You may... I, I, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. One is you follow the fair principles. Why else would you want to be? Got but you that. sign in blood against vendor locking and monopolizing. And Elsevier signed for that in their own blood. It was not blue. So <laughs> the uh, I really think that People start, also the Amazons and the Googles and the IBMs, they start to see they cannot dominate and monopolize this market. It's an internet approach. So all these platforms will find their natural niche in this federated system or die. Many of them will die. We go through this evolutionary bottleneck now. And scientists and service providers that do not adapt to this new paradigm, they will just get extinct. Like in every evolutionary bottleneck, I'm a biologist. We also have some victims, and we'll have many, especially people that try to suck the uh, breasts of the subsidy forever. I'm, I'm a fan. Great. Any, <laughs> any response, Daniel? Um, no, actually, it, it is difficult. <laughs> yeah. Just, we're all agreeing, and uh, so uh, I don't mean to just re rehearse the same things in, in other words. So let's move on to other questions. Well, Daniel, you should be able to put up some controversial stuff. You don't agree on everything. Well, well, I'd like to actually highlight what Daniel's presentation was about. So, so um, yeah. our project, uh, Enabling Fair Data, is a footnote, and I'm so proud of this, in the um, European Commission's Fair Data um, uh, interim report that uh, Daniel was, work, was briefing you on. I, I've never been so proud to be a footnote. Um, and uh, one of the um, really important elements here is um, what that document represents uh, to me and I think folks that are working towards these common um, North Star goals. And, and as Baron says, we're not all gonna get there in the same way, but if we all had the same direction, this is really valuable. Um, but one of my tasks uh, for my own project is staying aligned, you know, kind of like staying alive, staying aligned. If you keep staying aligned, we can all continue working together and supporting each other. So um, International Data Week's coming up in November, and I was asked to be on the panel with Simon Hudson and Sarah Jones, who are the 
um, uh, the chair and the repertoire for the reports that Daniel briefed us for. And so I had to hand in my abstract Monday. And of course, this meeting's today. So I am reading like a fiend all of these documents. And I have, this is good, and that is good, and this is good, and that is good. I don't have any negatives in there, except for one, uh, which is I think the publishers need to take more of a role, but I'll send them that note. Um, uh, but what is really valuable is that they have proposed to the rest of us working on FAIR that this is the framework. This is how we're going to all work together. So even, even if it's targeted towards a particular country and a, per a particular set of countries, it is for all of us to use as a roadmap. Um, and I am excited about this because I can very easily say we are aligned with the European Commission, we are moving forward together, and this is something that, that is valuable. Well, maybe uh, one additional word there. Uh, George Tron just sent me an email, so I know he's listening in. Uh, now I have to be careful what I say <laughs> about him. But one of the lessons he learned us was don't tell anyone else what to do. Uh, as I mentioned, so I believe that if we have organizations like AGU, Thank you. it's on my machine here, and the Biodiversity Institutes and the Metrology Institutes and the Sea Data Cloud, if they choose a standard, who else is going? If if you come up with some standards and choose some ontologies, who else will say with this critical mass? Nah, let's do something else. Well, if they want to waste their time, let them waste their time. Then you avoid five years discussion on the perfect standard. Just stay aligned, do it, and people will follow. If GBIF uh, decides, let's map all our species to, to the uh, catalog of life, I don't think many other people say, no, let's start a new one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the sea data cloud, if they encounter an organism in the sea, why not map it to GBIF? So that is the way NSFNet, I think, took off. They, they didn't go around and tell everyone to use TCP IP and, and domain names, but they had enough critical mass for everyone to come and say, I want to be part of this. So that was an important lesson for us. Okay, well, I simultaneously saw several hands raised, and I also sense that there is some desire for coffee and a break. So I'm going to make the decision to end the debate here and encourage everyone to uh, speak to the panelists during the coffee break. Oh, one more comment. Yes. Yeah, so now I actually have lots of things to comment, but yeah, I understand <laughs> that you're waiting for coffee. So I let do. me just make it short. Uh, I see lots of uh, ways in which the alignment between different initiatives could be improved. So there are lots of, or yeah, several initiatives springing up that have FAIR in their name. Some of them talk to each other. Some of them try to do things in a separate uh, way. Um, but for instance, there are concrete things. Um, we are in, at the Wilson Center and Anne mentioned citizen science. There are 10 citizen science principles or 10 principles for citizen science. And none of them uh, are really mentioning FAIR, although some of them touch on aspects of FAIR. And so um, there, one could think of extending those existing principles for citizen science um, to include FAIR as one, or like following the FAIR principles or uh, trying to achieve f FAIR compliance as an additional principle of doing citizen science. And so with such initiatives that are going on um, anyway, we have a higher um, chance to actually achieve um, the scaling of um, FAIR across different ecosystems. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and the, the FAIR metrics paper was published yesterday in Nature Scientific Data. So yesterday, there is the first possibility to actually measure fairness. So you can all go there if you want and uh, read it. Excellent. Well, um, please join me in thanking all of our panelists for their very interesting presentations and conversations.